Euh, donc bonjour à toutes et à tous. Euh, au nom de toutes les équipes de New Fund, je suis ravi de vous accueillir ce soir pour cette session très particulière, puisque nous accueillons Aaron Naldoza, l'un des piliers de l'équipe fondatrice de LinkedIn. Mais avant de rentrer dans le vif du sujet, de laisser la parole à Aaron et à Julien Poubel, l'animateur, mais surtout l'entrepreneur in residence chez New Fund, je voudrais prendre un, un instant pour planter le décor. Voilà, en temps normal, cette conférence aurait été réservée aux seuls entrepreneurs de New Fund et dans le cadre de la New Fund Week. Chaque année, nous avions l'habitude de les rassembler le temps d'une journée pour des ateliers ou des conférences. Le but, c'était de réfléchir sur les bonnes pratiques et les méthodes pour mieux piloter leur start-up. Avec la crise sanitaire, évidemment, on a repensé le, le, le format pour répartir une dizaine de sessions tout au long de la semaine toujours avec des intervenants de renom et qui ont marqué leur catégorie. La thématique choisie cette année, c'est le BizDev, Business Development, ou comment on s'organise pour booster les ventes dans un contexte économique un peu inédit. On est bien tous d'accord. C'est Aaron qui ouvre la semaine et on s'est dit que cela aurait été un peu un crime de réserver cette intervention à un petit comité et que cela pourrait être utile à une communauté d'entrepreneurs beaucoup plus large. Par conséquent, bienvenue à tous entrepreneurs New Fun et les autres. Sachez néanmoins que nous accueillerons aussi cette semaine, dans le désordre, Christophe Darny de, de Mano Mano, Dali Kilani, le CTO de Lifefun, Michael Chapu, négociateur au GIGN, mais aussi Lara Canafer et Yusra Meziani qui ont bossé chez Toucan Toco et Dataiku, et enfin Charlotte Accard, Clémence Desneiges de l'agence Charlie pour des ateliers dédiés. Ça, c'est le programme donc, qui sera réservé aux entrepreneurs New Fun seuls. Encore un mot, donc avant de passer le relais à Julien, je dois aussi rappeler pour ceux qui ne connaîtraient pas Newfun que nous sommes un fonds d'investissement early stage, né en 2008. On est doté de 250 millions d'euros avec des opérations en France et aux États-Unis. Il faut savoir que sur les 90 startups en portefeuille, nous avons 35 sociétés qui sont américaines. Nous mettons des tickets en seed, entre 300 000 et 1 million d'euros, quel que soit le secteur d'activité. Si vous souhaitez continuer la conversation à l'issue de cette conférence, n'hésitez pas à nous contacter. Allez, fini pour l'autopromo ce soir. On relève la tête du guidon et on prend un peu de recul par rapport aux opérations quotidiennes. Je m'adresse aussi à tous ceux qui nous écoutent. Vous aurez la possibilité de poser vos questions dans le fil. Et pour organiser ça, je vous propose de les faire passer par le module de chat de Zoom. Il suffira de cliquer sur le bouton « Converser ». Nous essaierons d'en faire passer un maximum. Voilà, on va désormais basculer in English et je passe le micro à Julien Boubel, entrepreneur in residence chez New Fund. Um, thanks a million and Aaron, thank you again for, for making the time. I was going to take about three minutes to set up why we're having this conversation today with, with all of you. And again, please don't be shy. Uh, anytime you feel like you want us to dig deeper, uh, just ask the question and we'll make sure to, uh, to meet your expectations. So uh, since I joined Newfound, um, I've been exposed to um, a dozen of great, great startups. And most of them have two challenges. Uh, one of them is the connection between sales and leadership. Uh, most of the entrepreneurs are software engineers uh, by trade um, and have uh, a limited understanding and time to really have a good grasp on how does sales function. And to address it today, uh, we have Aaron, and we're going to address it through two different uh, phases. The first one is specific to France and to seed and Series A organization. So how do we look at it? And when I say France, France, like any, any country. And then the second would be, if you decide to go to the States, uh, what kind of uh, type of salespeople will you be looking at? Uh, with that being said, Aaron, Uh, is used to be my manager, and we're talking about 13 years ago. At that time, LinkedIn was very small. It was not even $100 million revenue. And Aaron was already leading a, a very, very successful organization. But it's not only LinkedIn, it's many, many organizations in the past, including WeWork. And um, we're going to basically leverage all of the beautiful knowledge that he will be willing to share with us for the next 30 minutes. Aaron, would you mind taking a few minutes to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you very much, Julian. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. My name is Aaron Naldoza, and as Julian mentioned, I worked with him at LIDE. The pleasure of, of working with Julian at LinkedIn. I would never say I was his boss. Uh, if I could, if you could take one thing away, it's hire Julian Bubel and you'll be successful. He's one of the best reps I've ever worked with, so thank you. 
prior to that, I worked in Silicon Valley for seven years at another startup critical path that had an infamous ending. And then after LinkedIn, I pivoted to WeWork where I ran their go-to-market for their West Coast operations in the United States. It was a 150 person team with about 560 million in ARR. Um, we've all heard about WeWork and how it ended. And now I'm back at LinkedIn running their learning team for North America for the acquisition side. So thank you again, Julian. Awesome, man. So <laughs> I'll take the compliment, obviously. So <laughs> let's, start with, let's start with the sales black box, which we hear a lot about <coughs> a account executive. We hear a lot about RM, relationship manager. We hear a lot about account manager, about customer success before that customer support. And then now customer success managers. What can you help us understand why there is such a level of complexity within sales organization? And behind that question, like when you start and you have a couple of sales rep or five, 10, like how do you see the org should be organized? Yeah, it's a great question, Julian. And when you think about the complexity of a sales organization, all those roles are generally uh, appear in a, a more mature sales organization. So there's a series A sales organization, which is probably much smaller and has people who do multiple roles. But as you mature, the need for SDRs, for account executives, for account managers and CSMs, if you think about it, it really comes down to some basic economic principles or the basic economic principle division of labor. For those of you who studied economics and know Adam Smith, you know, he studied a pen manufacturer and he showed that a single person can make about 45 pins in a day. But when you broke out that division of labor into five or six different roles, a group of 10 people could produce well into the thousands of pins in a single day because they were able to focus on a specific task instead of doing everything. It's the same in sales. Prospecting is a very specific task. Even in SDR, there's two different tasks. There's collecting leads from marketing, talking to them, and there's outbound prospecting to people who aren't expecting you to, to call them, cold prospecting and inbound leads. So even within SDR, there's a division of labor. And then the account executive role, which is taking people through the sales cycle once they enter the funnel and then closing them, and then the account management, which is nurturing and growing them. But in there, really the, the role, and you know this very well, Julian, because at LinkedIn, you were one of these people, the role of the account manager isn't to just retain the customer, it's to expand the footprint. LinkedIn had what we call land and expand model, where the AEs was more about velocity and less about taking down the whole uh, account. And then the account managers, their job was to grow it. Customer success comes in because we, we know, especially in a SaaS world, that early adoption is a key indicator of future renewal. Accounts that buy from you and don't use your product are much more likely to churn than accounts that buy from you and use the product. And that's really where customer success comes in because if you're trying to expand a customer, spending all your time getting them to adopt, actually you can't do both of those extremely efficiently. Now, early in an organization, you can't hire an SDR and you know, a whole bunch of SDRs, a whole bunch of AEs, account managers and CSMs. So you have to determine usually what happens is people care much more about the acquisition of customers than the retention and growth of customers. So they invest early in account executives. And we can go deeper here, but with account executives in an early, in a early uh, stage startup, really what you need is an account executive who can wear both an SDR hat and prospect and an account executive hat and close. And most account executives have been an SDR, but I believe you're an SDR at one point, Julian. Um, you know, every account executive at some point in time has had to prospect, at least any successful account executive. So that division of labor isn't that difficult. It does increase their or decrease their productivity when they have to do both. But I'll pause there and see if there's any follow-ups or if you want to go deeper in any of those areas. I'd love to. Um, you know, there are a lot of rumors about, you know, do you really need SDRs? Like, is, is cold calling dead? And, and look yeah. at the email, you know, most of the people that are currently listening to us, they got like hundreds of the email they don't even open. Yep. So it will be extremely insightful for you to walk us through with WeWork, with LinkedIn, uh, what's the appetite towards the SDR efforts and what are the traits and what are the skills that are required to be effective uh, in the way that you're reaching out to your prospect. And that will be very, very valuable for early stage companies to understand. Yeah, uh, SDR is a sales development representative. I see a question in the chat. So I figured I would just jump on that. Um, and their job is to get appointments for salespeople. So they don't close business, they prospect. 
Now, before we get into the SDR uh, topic, though, I think there's one thing that we're missing is that marketing, the intersection of marketing and sales is really important. And if you're going to have a marketing led product where you invest a lot in marketing, then your sales efforts could be less. Conversely, if you have very little marketing effort, the only way to get your name out there and to get people to talk to you is through outbound activity from a sales organization. And most right now, it's mostly the founders using their connections, et cetera. So if you invest a lot in marketing, you most certainly need somebody to follow up on those leads. Marketing gets the people in the door. And that's where SDRs, from an inbound perspective, that means marketing is bringing leads into the organization. And SDRs will follow up on those. If you don't have heavy marketing, then it's much more of an outbound motion for SDRs. And the reason you want sales development representatives, and I strongly believe in this, and just for full disclosure, I ran LinkedIn sales development, North America, Latin America, and um, Pacific region for three years. So, um, but the reason you want SDRs is again, the division of labor. Prospecting is a very time intensive um, activity. And as you all know, you receive hundreds of emails. Um, so, the idea of an SDR is there's two functions. There's one in a, and I'm going to talk about organizations that don't have heavy marketing budgets because I'm assuming most of your series A companies don't have, aren't investing a lot of millions of dollars in marketing. Um, so an outbound SDR, what they will do is they'll get your brand out into the, uh, out there through their activities. While you may not, while people may not respond to those emails, they'll see them and know that there is a company out there reaching out to them. Two, they will get some early um, appointments for your AEs. And then your AEs can focus more on managing the sales cycle, which is doing deep discovery and moving people through the sales cycle to close. Whereas an SDR, their whole job is just to set appointments with people like Frederick, myself, and you, Julian, so that people will have full calendars. Um, and SDR teams are actually growing. If you look in Silicon Valley, more people are starting with what is called an inside sales team, people inside who are doing outreach and prospecting. Now, the key to doing good prospecting, you mentioned cold calling, is you know, the idea of cold calling is dead, is networking, leveraging tools like Zoom Info, clearly LinkedIn, which I'm biased for, um, but understanding your prospects, understanding what they're doing in their personal and professional lives, what your value prop as a product is so that you can find the right people, your, your ideal customer profile, and really empowering these SDRs to know who to reach out to. There's probably a small subset of individuals that need to reach out to, and they need a very refined message about what the value proposition of whatever it is they're trying to sell is. And they're really selling the appointment. My job as an SDR is to get Julie in a conversation with Frederick. Therefore, I need to convince Frederick that he can use 10, 15 minutes of his time and it's valuable for him to talk to Julian because we can help him either solve a problem or have great gains in his business through the solution that we're providing. And that takes a lot of time, energy, and effort. If Julian is also having to do that and try and run a full sales cycle and close business, his productivity will decrease. Now, at the beginning, Julian's going to have to do it all because it's inefficient to hire an SDR and an AE until you know what your value prop is, who your ideal buyer is what customer there is. Um, so I'll pause there. There's probably lots of follow-ups and questions, but SDRs are extremely valuable. The other thing, S SDRs are relatively junior. So you don't have to pay them a lot. And they're usually very early in their career and you can shape them and mold them to do things the way you want to. And they will be your future talent pipeline. I saw the question about AI. Um, you can replace a lot of activities that SDRs do with AI, absolutely. But ideally, if your company does scale, and you go to series D and you go public, or you even if you stay private and you grow your revenue year over year, your sales development team, they will be the talent that eventually becomes your account executives, your managers, and eventually your directors and senior sales leaders, if you set it up correctly. Aaron, uh, let, let me, let me uh, piggyback on, on Mark's question and then move to AE. Yeah. Uh, this is great. Um, thank you. So no. back to Mark's question, what do you think AI can do yeah. To support the sales effort. And what do you think an SDR, a, a young, talented salesperson, will keep doing for the next couple of years? Yeah, AI can do a lot of the manual labor of sending emails. So right now, there's a, there's a whole bunch of, um, well, actually, on inbound, for, first of all, AI can recognize an inbound lead and know whether it's customer service or whether it's actually a sales lead. 
and you know the the they can differentiate those to get people to the right place you know and in the organization that I've worked in we had human beings picking up the phone and routing people it's wildly inefficient and we only had one um, phone number to call so oftentimes it was a salesperson getting a customer success call or a, cu a customer complaint and having to find who they can send that to AI can take care of that on the front end um, AI can also help identify the right people through the right signals and LinkedIn has some of this built in and I don't know if you'd call it AI necessarily um, but from uh, looking at signals of the activities people are taking on your website and and engaging with your product you can use those signals to then identify people who have a higher propensity to buy and then target your sdrs to go and speak with them i think the one thing ai is going to have a hard time replacing is the human interaction and julian you know this because you're one of the best i've seen at it is people buy from people they like and they want to have a conversation um, you know some people will buy without ever speaking to a human being that has happened and we've seen that as well um, at WeWork, we actually instituted virtual tours of our sites and we used something called Matterport where people could go and actually see the site and they could buy without ever speaking to a human being. They could see the office they wanted, what the view looked like, the size, they saw the rate card and they could just purchase buy right there. So AI can replace a lot of it, but when you get into bigger transactions and you get into more complex transactions, I think AI is going to have a hard time replacing what an SDR and an AE can do. But it certainly has a place and people should leverage it because you can hire fewer people and have them focus on more high value activities. Thanks, Aaron. So we talked about SDR. Can we talk a little yeah. bit about the AE, uh, yeah. account executive? And um, let's start with how dif different, and to piggyback on, on Mark's question, how different an AE is today, 2020, versus what it was 10 years ago? Yeah, I think they're, they're wildly different. In AE, 10 years ago, even you looked for someone who was a hunter, you know, the typical um, prototypical is a type who's highly driven and um, very social who can own the room and come in and had a big personality. And, um, and they built relationships and they leveraged that relationship capital to win a transaction. Today, our buyers are far more informed before most of us even buy anything in our personal and professional lives. We've done a lot of research. And we're much further down the buyer journey than we were in the past with all the different um, you know, G2 crowd. You can go and do research on every single software solution that you want to buy, every SaaS company out there and see all the reviews and verbatims from the users. So today's sales rep is much more consultative and they have to be, think much more about what is the value I'm going to provide to my customer? What are their, what are their problems that they're facing? And what are their objectives? And what does my solution do to help them achieve those objectives? And quite frankly, most of my best sales reps these days aren't the prototypical A-type, you know, in the US, we'd call them a jock, the former baseball or football or basketball or football player in, in, uh, in France as well, the people who had charisma. Today, most of my best salespeople are highly analytical, extremely organized. They're able to manage their time and they're much more consultative and they build, do build relationships with their customers around what value we provide to them and what solutions we can solve for them or uh, what problems we can solve for them through our solutions. Those are the people who are successful. There's still relationship capital and emotional intelligence still matters, but if you can't do those other things, providing value and really understanding the customer's needs and being extremely curious, you won't succeed. A good smile, a nice haircut and big personality doesn't get you anywhere anymore in sales. So how, how different is the new breed of AE versus the RM? Yeah, they're still different. The new breed of AE. So the way I explain AE versus RM, an account executive starts the year with nothing in their pipeline. They have to build that pipeline. They still enjoy the thrill of the chase and convincing you. Uh, RM is a relationship manager or an account manager. It depends on the company where you're at. And once a customer, once you sell someone and they sign on the, on, on, uh, the paper, they'll go over to, in some organizations, they'll go over to an account manager, a relationship manager. An account executive still wants to hunt, hunt and they want to close new business. And they're, they have a higher risk tolerance generally than an account manager. Um, they're, like I said, at the beginning of the year, they get their quota, they don't have much in the pipeline, and they've got to build that. 
and they can build, you know, depending on the sales cycle over six months, 12 months for that close at the end with lots of uncertainty. And they are very process oriented and they're also very dedicated to prospecting. They really know how to get their funnel filled up. An RM and our account manager, they usually start the year knowing that they're going to have a X number of renewal calls. They have customers. Someone's going to talk to them about budget and their job is to show the value of the solution that was already purchased and help them improve the way they're using it to get an incremental value and then convince them that they would do better if their entire company or their entire organization was on that solution and that they could do more and have more success if they further invested in that solution. So those are sort of the two differences between the roles. From a mindset perspective, an account executive usually is someone who, like I said, the biggest key indicator to me is has a higher tolerance for risk and is also much uh, is able to deal with uncertainty and lack of, pro and lack of um, clarity around what's happening on a day-to-day. An account manager, if they have a full book of business, is, their day is extremely structured. They know when their renewal call, calls are. They know when their quarterly business reviews are. They have to engage with the customer success manager to make sure people are using the tool. They're a quarterback of internal resources to get people to get value out of the tool. An account executive is much more evangelical. They're selling a dream. They're selling what the solution can do. And they're probably people who are much better able to articulate that and to overcome objections and to take no. They'll have thicker skin. They'll also enjoy the, um, the feeling of uncertainty. And uh, those are the two biggest differences between the two, in my opinion. There are people who can do both. Julian, you're someone who could do both. You hunted very well in your book of business. But uh, as you get bigger, you definitely want to differentiate those two. Early on, you're looking much more for that account executive type of mentality. And then eventually, if, you, if they're successful enough, you'll need to hire people who have much more of that account management mentality of the nurture, building longer term relationships, investing in those relationships. So before we, you talked about customer success manager, Aaron, yeah. how through the interview process, are you able to quickly, what kind of signal are you looking at? when you want to hire an AE versus hiring an RM? What are you looking at? Yeah, there's a few things I would look at. One is their, and the comp structure is usually different too. An AE will have 50% of their total compensation package will be in, in um, variable compensation, meaning they only earn it if they close business. An account executive usually is aggressive account, account manager rather, uh, is usually 60-40. Usually 70% is base and 30% is variable, meaning they take less risk on even in their own compensation. So that's one very easy way to determine when you're talking to someone. If I ask Frederick if he would like a 50-50 comp plan or a 70-30 comp plan, and he says 70-30, that's a pretty key indicator to me where his mindset is. So that's pretty easy. The other one is in a track record and asking them, you can ask some questions. If I gave you a book of business, that was prospects, how would you approach it? What is your mentality? And a, someone who's heavily account management oriented would fumble over that. A good account executive will have a process. Sales, there's a science of sales and it's a math formula. If you give me a thousand accounts, I need to get X number of conversations. I need to get 10 conversations to get one real opportunity. And I need, in order to get one real opportunity to close. So that means I need to have a hundred conversations to get 10 closed one transactions and an account executive will be able to break down what their formula is. They'll be able to make assumptions around conversion rates about how many conversations they think they can get based on your product and the brand awareness of the product. And they can really dissect the math of how they're going to get to their number based off those conversion rates, the average sales price, the time to close. That formula is gold to any good salesperson. They'll know it inside and out. And if they can't articulate that. They're probably never really hunted before or they didn't hunt very successfully before. Excellent. And we have, we have a little piece of insight from whom I consider the best ever client director at Gartner who was managing partnership with yeah. Gartner's largest client, Oracle, Cisco, Sharon O'Neill, who mentioned pay attention to patients. What do you think? Yeah. What, what's your perspective on that? Patients in terms of the, is the AE patient or not? This is RM, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, it's funny because the, the longer the sales cycle, the more patient you need to be as an AE. So, um, but yes, AEs generally uh, are less patient. Um, 
RMs are, uh, you know, very patient. Um, but in a longer sales cycle, in a transactional sales cycle, you have to be highly impatient and you need to hold people to timelines, set expectations and move the ball forward in every conversation. If there's not a clear next step in every conversation, then you move on and you move to the next one because you have a thousand prospects you could reach out to. An account manager, because they're already a customer and you don't want to lose them, you have to be a little more patient with them. There may not always be clear next steps, et cetera. In a long sales cycle, we've had sales cycles upwards of three years that I've seen. We've had to be patient, unfortunately. Um, budget, timing, executive buy-in isn't there. Um, but these are you know, seven-figure deals that take a long time to develop. So uh, in those, there's a little more patience required, the more seniority there is in the salespeople. Excellent. So before we address a really good question from Timothy about how we scale from five to 20 to 50, yeah. can we talk the last uh, strategic role within a sales organization, customer success manager? Yeah. Well, to me, the customer success manager, it's, I don't know if it's relatively new, but it was late at LinkedIn when we were there. And we realized we did much analysis that people who weren't using the tool were churning. It's very logical. So we thought about how we were going to approach this. And at WeWork, the same thing happened. People weren't utilizing our space. They weren't coming in. They weren't engaging in, in what the offerings that we had. So we would hire customer, lots of customer success reps to come in. And customer success is highly important in any organization. I think the way you approach it really depends on the product and to whom you're selling and the size and scale of organizations you're selling to. In smaller customers, the idea is, uh, you know, early on, you're going to have to hire customer success managers. Really, their role is to engage the customer and get them to see the value of the product and help them use the product in a way that they want to to solve the problem that they bought it for, or to see the incremental gains in their in their business performance that they bought the solution for. So that role is extremely important. Their job isn't to upsell. It's not to try and get them to take the whole organization in, but they are very key. The customer success manager and the account manager work hand in hand. And if they're working well together, the customer success, success manager will help the customer see the value in the tool such that they will want to buy more. Um, so an account manager worth her salt will most certainly engage the customer success manager and they will have a joint plan to get the customer um, to grow. Um, with that being said, what generally happens is organizations hire lots of people to solve problems that you should be thinking about scaling. Um, so onboarding, for example, especially for your smaller customers, as much as you can do online and have self-service um, tools, the better. It's more cost-effective than hiring people to solve that problem. Now, when you get to a certain point, you do want to have customer success highly involved in your largest enterprise-wide customers because they'll build relationships. They'll understand who the influencers in the organization are. If you lose your key decision maker, they will have other relationships you can leverage. Um, so as you grow, making sure that customer success is highly integrated with the client across the board, not just the people using the tool, but also with the executives is extremely useful. Um, but yeah, customer success is uh, the one difference is sometimes they're paid on numbers like churn. So their job is to reduce churn. And uh, also in some organizations, they're paid on adoption rates, how many people in the organization are actually using it. And uh, those will be the KPIs they're, they're um, paid on, whereas the account manager will be paid on renewal rate and growth within the account. So that clearly like differentiates the two roles and what they care about are those KPIs. Um, that answer the question, Julian? Absolutely. So okay. we have a question from Mohammed, uh, which mm -hmm. I'm struggling a little bit. Uh, Fred, maybe you can help here. It's the merge between CSR. I'm not sure what CSR are. Mohammed, it might be CSM. CSM? No, no, no. CSR, it, it, it is uh, SDR. Oh, it's SDR. 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 Okay. Yeah. So the, the question is, would you rather merge CSR, so SDR and AE, or A and CSM when you know you're limited in terms of budget and funding? I would do uh, AE and SDR because it's a natural, AE is like, Julian started as an SDR before he became a salesperson. And in, in today's world, most ex account executives were an SDR at some point in time. And a lot of, it, just because an AE has an SDR doesn't mean she stops prospecting. Every good AE, even our most senior AEs will always prospect. They'll leverage their relationships. They'll leverage the tools they have to understand 
who their buyer person, what their buyer personas are doing, when, uh, what the, what messages they can leverage to reach out, what the value prop of your product is. So AEs will always prospect. SDRs just do it at a higher volume and uh, they create lots of leverage for the AE organization. But if you have to give up one of them, I would give, I would have AE and CSM I and combine the SDR AE role. Perfect. Um, so we're starting to get more and more questions and thank you so, so much, Karine, Mylène. Um, let's take Karine's question and, and, and it's going to for the next two, three minutes and then we're going to address the, the one about scale. Uh, Karine is asking what's the difference on a daily basis between an account manager and a customer success manager on a daily basis? Yeah, on a daily basis, an account manager will be thinking about how to get an account to grow. How do I get, so at LinkedIn, we were selling recruiters, job slots, and career pages. How do I get them to go all in in recruitment media and to get every one of their jobs on, uh, every one of the jobs they have posted? How do we fill those with our job slots and how do we get every recruiter to use our recruiting tool? That's what the account manager is thinking about. And what's the strategy? Who in the organization can either, do I have to go try and get budget from? Who do I have to convince that this is the right thing to do? The CSM is thinking, how do I get the recruiters who are on the tool or whoever it is using my tool, the engineers, whomever it may be, how do I get them to use the tool more and to get value out of the tool such that the customer wants to renew that contract? How do I make sure that they're getting the value they, that they thought they were going to get out of the tool when the account executive was, who's very evangelical sold them this dream? How do we make that dream become reality? And that's what the customer success manager is thinking about on a daily basis. And they should be laser focused on retention and adoption. Milan, you have to forgive us. Your question is very much, which sales team when you, you're a startup at the beginning, it depends very much what kind of environment you're selling to. Uh, and I'll, I'll share with you, Milan, my email address and we'll, we'll talk about that um, if you don't mind. So we've got another 10 plus minutes. I'd love uh, for you, Aaron, to answer uh, Timothy's question about five to 20, 20 to 50, what, what, what are the KPIs? What, what, what's the indicator you're looking at? What's the process to scale? So we're gonna take about five good minutes to address this question. And then the last five minutes, we're gonna focus on what happened when it's not working? How do you yeah. know that it's not working? That your sales engine that you built is not working and what kind of actions you're taking? Yeah, they may the bleed end, into each other. Probably, um, probably. Yeah. Please go ahead, Aaron. <sighs> So five to five to 10 or five to 15, you have your sales reps. And at that point in time, you'll need to hire, um, you know, there's two schools of thoughts and I've provided Julian with a whole bunch of links and he can share them with you. There's a school of thought of when you get to 10 or 15 people, you hire a vice president of sales, someone who now that you've got your sales playbook, you know what your value prop is, you know who your ideal customer profile is. And you've had some success with your sales reps going and, and closing some transactions. And now you need to scale this organization. Presumably, if you're going to go from five to 10, eventually you're going to go from 10 to 20 or 30. So if you hire that VP of sales, you really need to make sure that she has done this before. And she and you're usually hiring someone who is uh, who's going to who today is overqualified for that job. But as the organization grows, she's going to be able to build that team and build it in her image with you. Uh, and she she's not coming in to solve all the questions or solve all the, uh, you know, with all the answers, but she's really coming to scale because you've figured out that you have a product and there's a product market fit and you can sell this. Um, so from five to 10, that's one school of thought is get your VP of, of sales who's going to grow this actually to 30 or 40 because that VP of sales, one of the key questions is if you could hire someone today, if, who are you bringing with you to come to this organization to help us scale this organization? They will have a Rolodex of people. They'll have people that they can bring with them to help them scale the organization. Or if you don't want to do that quite yet, and you still think there's some room to grow in terms of your sales playbook and your go to market, you can hire a sales manager. There's two schools of thought is one of the reps who maybe was more senior when you hired her can move into that role. Or you hire a sales manager externally and bring them in and they eventually will grow to director. Um, it really depends on what you think the rate of growth will be. To me personally, if I'm in a startup, if I'm going to go to a startup, I want to go and be the VP who's taking it from five to 30 to 50 and growing with the organization. Um, 
So that's on the hiring part. In terms of tools and systems, when you go from five to 10, you need a manager. The 10, you can't, as a founder, manage 10 reps. Even managing five reps is really difficult. You're going to need someone who is a specialist and can hold people accountable. I think, Julian, one of your questions was, what do you measure during this time? Or are we going to save that for the back half? Please go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So really, a few things that you want to measure are pipeline growth and pipeline conversion. That's ultimately what matters the most is what are people putting in the top of the funnel? And if you're not familiar with the funnel as a sales funnel is looks like a funnel you use in the kitchen and it narrows when it gets to the bottom, it doesn't close all the way off, but you want people who are adding the right amount of number of opportunities at the right dollar size and then converting those to closed one transactions. And you need someone who can come in and help manage those. She will also need to sell. She will need to be involved in your biggest transactions with the biggest customers. She will also need to be evangelical, but she'll uh, help close those. She won't carry the book necessarily. She won't own those accounts, but she will help the AEs close those bigger transactions and the real strategic ones that you used to previously be involved in as a founder. And she will hold them accountable to the right KPIs, the things that matter, not only what you're closing, but also pipeline velocity. Sales is a lagging indicator. By the time you close something, even if you have a very short sales cycle, someone's been working on that for upwards of, at a bare minimum, 25, 30 days, sometimes 60 days, sometimes 90 days, depending on when you started those conversations. Sales cycles can be very elongated. So if all you're looking at is closed one and no one's filling the pipeline again, that's not a good indicator. So the, your new manager will measure things like this. How many new opportunities are we adding to the pipeline? And then what are they converting at down the pipeline? And making sure that the reps have good data quality and they're actually putting real information into the pipeline, which is a challenge even for large sales organizations. So that's when you hire that first manager. And then as you scale, then you start talking about sales productivity tools and things, you know, you need a CRM, Salesforce, all the different CRMs out there. You need sales tools as well. You need SDR tools. There's a whole bunch of different tools that you can buy in your technology stack. And your sales leader, that's why hiring the VP early on is helpful because she will know what that sales stack looks like and be able to work with your sales productivity team or your engineering team to build the right sales stack for your go-to-market motion. And you're all technologists and mostly engineers who build technology stacks. So you know the importance of building the right foundation for long-term growth. If you get the right person in, they will help you build that as well. Um, the VP early on will help with sales enablement, they'll help with the sales stack, they'll make sure you have the right KPIs to measure, and then they'll hold people accountable, and then they'll also A-B test, and they'll, they'll validate your assumptions and work very closely with product to make sure that you're adapting to what the customer needs are. It's a big job, and there's a lot of things to do there, so they can't spend all their time selling or just, you know, if you hire someone and they just want to run the sales org, you're going to miss out on all the goodness they could provide to the rest of the org and also miss out on the opportunity to build the right foundation for future success. That's my personal opinion, but there's lots of opinions on this one. There's no right answer. Uh, there is, there is a, another excellent question from Timothy, uh, which is, um, you know, you've been managing, Aaron, many, many teams from five critical paths up to hundreds we work. Well, what are the signals that you see that, that are warnings in terms of scaling your teams? What kind of signal do you see? I think, Timothy, you're spitful, but what, what do you see that, you know, you currently have five sales reps and you're like, my God, I'm, I'm in the dead end. I'm not going to be able to scale to 10 or I'm in 10. I'm not going to be able to scale to 50. What, what kind of signals, what, what kind of things are you looking at, whether it's process, whether it's people, whether it's culture, what are the things you're paying close attention to? <laughs> All of the above. <laughs> so there is process. If you don't have a good process, it, it will collapse. You know, if you put 20, and the same with engineering, if you put 20 engineers on a bad engineering stack, it's not going to work out or any, anything. Um, so process, I also think, uh, you know, you think about when you hire somebody, it's a, you're looking for a return on investment. So really understanding, are you getting that return? And I think that's where you, the, the nexus of your next question about when, when it's not working, what do you do? Um, so if you build it right, you'll have very, you'll have very clear pictures of whether it's working or not uh, early on. And part of that is closed one, part of that is pipe build. But as a founder, if you have three or four people, you'll need to still be involved. 
you know, the old adage, trust but verify. Um, and I think, Julian, I told you the story at WeWork. I worked for a gentleman named, named John Slavitt, who was very operational. And he had essentially run sales before I got there. And he was very reluctant to give up control. So what he and I agreed to was I would send him an update every Friday and all the core KPIs. And then we would use objectives and key results, OKRs, which are very commonplace in Silicon Valley, for him to track my progress against the highest, pri the, the items we mutually agreed upon were highest priority for me to achieve in order for us to be successful. A lot of it was around sale, around hiring and sales enablement and onboarding, reducing the time to onboard so we can get reps productive and get them at full capacity, which is both pipe build and also closed one transactions. And we needed them to be fully productive within six months. It used to take 12 months to get people there. So we had to really reduce that time. And I worked very closely with sales readiness with my, uh, with my head of sales readiness to build her OKRs out so they aligned with mine. Um, and we met on a, on a biweekly basis to go over those and track those and have him help me remove blockers. So he was highly involved in that. And he was useful because he helped me remove blockers. But I felt extremely, I, held, I was held to a very high bar of accountability where I had to move the needle on these things. Otherwise, I wasn't doing my job. And it was very clear that I wasn't doing my job. I personally liked that because it kept me very organized and I was able to come in and see where we're moving the needle and I could get help where we needed help. Um, so I think that's a, a very, when you think about whether you can scale or not, you're going to need to be involved in the business and you're going to need to see whether or not you're able to move the ball forward. And when I say move the ball forward, make progress on your key objectives for the sales team. And if they're not making progress with you verifying that, then something's going wrong. And you need to either reassess whether you have the right person, whether your objectives are realistic, or are there are other barriers that are preventing you from doing from, from being successful. So we've got some great questions from David and Olga. And before we address them, um, so it's not working and you can't connect. Yeah. You're the entrepreneur, you've got a team of five, 10, 15 sales rep, and you don't, you don't hit your numbers. I mean, it's not working. Um, question number one, Aaron, when you have that gut feeling that it's not working, as the entrepreneur, what's the best way to start the conversation with your sales team or with your sales leader? Yeah. And then the second question, if, if it's not working, then as the entrepreneur, what kind of decision can you make? Yeah, I think the, so starting the conversation in sales, we like to say there should be no surprises. So starting the conversation should start day one when you hire your sales team and leaders, you should check in with them incrementally. And there's a few simple things you could do to validate whether or not their uh, pipeline, pardon my language, is BS or is not. And there's a simple acronym in sales called BANT budget, authority, need, and time frame. And you should be able to look at the deals and on the bigger deals, ask where they, what, who, do they have budget for this? Are you talking to the decision maker, the authority? What's the need? What solution are we solving? And what's the time frame expectations when this will close? And if you're feeling that, that things aren't moving as your sales team is communicating to you, then you should ask to be involved in the next phone call so you can validate some of these things yourself. You're gonna need to be involved, especially in a small sales team. And you'll want to hear from the customer's perspective, those key things, bent. And if they can't clearly identify those in next steps, it's not, a, it's not a real deal. So do that early on so that you don't have to have this conversation later. And you can be very clear with, hey, Aaron, you're not meeting expectations. I've been on four of your calls. You told me that you had, you're talking to the decision maker, they had budget, and this was supposed to close in the next month. The last call, none of those were indicated. In fact, they didn't commit to any of that. And then you could start to call BS on your salespeople and be involved, um, such that when they miss their targets, you you've already had the conversation that unless this changes, Aaron, we're going to have to make you know we're going to you're either going to have to exit the organization or you're going to need to change this, so that that conversation is easier at the end. Um, and if you get to that point where you've seen enough of the instances where they don't have these things in the sales cycle uh, identified and the customer's not communicating those things in next steps then the benefit of having more than one salesperson is you can rely on other salespeople to pick up the slack. If you have one salesperson, you know, a lot of the articles I sent you, Julian, indicated that you shouldn't just hire one, you should hire two salespeople because A, salespeople thrive off of competition and also teamwork and camaraderie. And B, if you have to let one of them go, your whole sales engine doesn't collapse. So then you let go of one of them, you hire the next one. And then you do the same thing and you're always gonna to have to be validating. Now, if you have somebody who's consistently closing and overperforming, 
Uh, the other key part of having two different salespeople is you can see if it was just an exceptional individual or if you can duplicate that. Because ideally, if you have an, a great salesperson, you can take what she does and you can duplicate it. So when new people come in, they know the process and they don't have to learn everything again. You improve your sales playbook and everyone takes that and incrementally improves upon that. Um, if you have one person and they fail, is it you? Is it the product? Was it them? You have less data to go off of. Excellent. Aaron, makes total sense. So let's take David's question, which is something that happened right now, especially with COVID. Uh, cold call is not working. Email is not working. Uh, the pipe is empty. And you know, you've got your numbers to hit to, to pay for the bills and make sure your employees are happy. What, what do you do? So obviously French people will go hacking. That's what we do for a living. We're really good at it, but is there any other option? The other option is determining whether or not you need to change your go-to-market or your value proposition. Like, is your product providing the value that people need today? And a lot of customers have seen that change or a lot of companies have seen that change with COVID. It's not a priority anymore because the world has changed. Um, so can you find your niche or can you find a different um, value proposition that resonates in today's world where digital transformation is accelerating. Somebody uh, jokingly put that 2020 is the new 20, 2030 when it comes to technology, because we've taken this 10 year leap in technological advancement because of where we're at, out of necessity. So if your product isn't part of that, then what can you do? Or maybe people don't realize that it's part of that. And maybe you need a different value prop. Maybe it's a different buyer. Maybe there's a different use case, but um, it's really hard to say without knowing the specific product, who the buyer persona is, who, which type of companies are you trying to sell? That's a very broad question, but um, those would be my initial. If I was a salesperson in this instance, I would, and I was doing the same thing and not seeing the results, I would think about stripping that entire process down, probably A-B testing, picking two different hypotheses around what is the new value prop or what is the, who's the new buyer persona I need to try this value prop on and then try and get into, into conversations with them. And I understand it, like I'm a big proponent of using the phone when possible. People are working from home, their desk phones aren't working anymore. Um, so what we're having to rely on is far more introductions, much more what at LinkedIn we call modern selling, using LinkedIn to find, do we have people in common or is there something I can take off their profile and use in a really tailored message specifically about how we can help their business with this product and uh, go a little more lower touch, but much more um, specialized and individualized to the person I'm trying to have a conversation with. Um, those are some of the things I would initially think about depending on the product. Aaron, we've got five minutes left. I'd love to pick one of Olga's uh, questions, sure. uh, which is awesome, uh, especially it's back to the previous question from Timothy, which is, so you're head of sales, you're wearing head of marketing, head of sales, head of customer success, everything. Up to how many people can you manage? And at one point, do you need mid leadership, like someone to hire to manage uh, your individual contributors? So, um, and then once you answer um, Olga's question, the last question we will have for you is, so congratulations, uh, Aaron, you're, from now you're a French entrepreneur, you're doing extremely well, and you wanna expand to the US, you're gonna hire your first American sales rep, what kind of talent are you looking for? B2B, the regular, you know, B2B. Regular software. SaaS, B2B, yeah, okay. Exactly. But first, so the first oh yeah, yeah. Now the, the first question is yeah. at what point do I need, uh, do you need to expand your sales leadership team? At what size organization? Um, again, it depends on the growth rate and how quickly you expect to grow. I personally like hiring people when the team, uh, before they exceed capacity. So if I'm a startup sales manager and my team is five and I'm expected to grow to 10, I would either hire uh, another sales manager or director prior to the team getting to 10. There's a couple of reasons. One is I, um, I like allowing my leaders to build their own teams, it's useful. And two, if someone is trying to do everything and they're at capacity and you only give them a relief when they get at or above capacity, there, there becomes decreasing marginal returns on what they're, what they're producing for the organization. 
And I, I know that the strain that puts on an individual and at startups, everyone has to do more and everyone has to do a lot more. But if you're in growth mode and you know you're going to grow towards a certain, uh, to a certain size, getting ahead of that and getting the right people in place ahead of time is really useful so they can build that organization in the right way, in a more methodical way. Now that doesn't always happen. I've, in fact, I've never seen it happen that way. Usually what happens is you go from five direct reports to 15 and then you hire a sales manager. But that time frame where you have 15 direct reports, the business suffers. So if you can get ahead of it, get ahead of it. And that's my personal opinion. Um, was there another part to that question, Julian? I'm not nope. sure I got it. Nope. Okay. Um, no, that's, uh, so is there a magic number? I think the, uh, the standard ratio is one to seven. I've seen, uh, depending on the sales cycle and how complex it is, the, the larger your average sales price and the more complex the sales cycle, that number should be lower. If it's a highly transactional, low, you know, if you're selling $7,000 product and you have a more junior salesperson and it's a 25 day close, you can manage upwards of 10 to 11 people. That's on the high end. But if you want your managers to not only hold people accountable to the KPIs you want and coach and develop your employees, you can't do that with 10, 11 people. It's very difficult. One to eight is usually, in a mature company, one to eight is the max. And on large org, I've seen one to four or five, depending on how senior the uh, the reps are. You know, in, our, in a global account management team, there's a director with three or four reps, but those reps have multi-million dollar quotas as well. So quota and your return on investment on those reps is also part of it too. That's why uh, yeah. reps with lower quotas, you have higher ratios generally. Makes total sense. So the last one, Aaron Naldoza, French citizen. <laughs> My dream come true. Um, you're going to hire your first sales rep. Well, one, I'll go back to the comment I made about hiring two, not one. Um, it depends on what you're selling. If you're selling a very large ASP ERP uh, SaaS solution, um, and you may not be able to afford to, um, but usually you're small, selling into smaller customers at the outset. So I would still argue that you'd want to hire two. And really what you're looking for are people who are not afraid of prospecting. People have a growth mindset, are very curious, and who can evangelize your product. Um, and again, Julian, I keep paying you compliments, but this is true. Julian is one of the best evangelists I've ever met. When he believes something, he, you could feel it, the passion exudes when he talks about it. And that's uh, extremely uh, contagious when you're talking to people about your product, the belief that they have in the product is extreme. Uh, I, I can't stress it enough. As a salesperson, there's nothing worse than selling something you don't believe in. So find someone who's passionate about your product and about what you're doing. It's helpful if you can. And then two, they have to have an extremely high, uh, they have to have, we call it, a, I call it a uh, high motor, but strong work ethic, whatever you want to call it. They have to be people who are willing to put in a lot of work. Sales for a series A company, no matter how amazing the product is extremely difficult. You're going to be rejected more than you will have success and you have to have a positive attitude and you have to constantly be able to pick yourself up on down times and keep going. Uh, and then that goes to the growth mindset and the curiosity of, of trying lots of things. The benefit of having two reps is you can do, take two different approaches and see which one works best and you could test and you could have different hypotheses. Um, but the, the curiosity, the evangelism, the energy, the ability to work, and they cannot be afraid of prospecting. They have, you know, when you ask that question early on, if I give you a book of business of, you know, you have the entire United States to sell into. How are you prioritizing your time and where are you going after? Now, clearly as a founder, you have to tell them who your target market is, which types of companies, who you've been successful having conversations with and selling to so that they have some direction. Um, but those are the things I'd look for, people who thrive in that type of environment. You don't necessarily need someone who's been extremely senior. If they've worked at Salesforce for 15 years, that's probably actually not the right profile. You probably want someone who's been an SDR to start up and maybe been an account executive one who's really had to grind. Um, but the more senior the person I find, the harder it is for them to, um, to actually adapt to that type of Series A um, evangelical sale that just, it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort. So you, generally you want someone who's extremely hungry and not afraid of the work and believes in your product. So I've repeated myself three times. I apologize, but yeah. uh, it, it's yeah. Aaron. It was worth it. It's it's counterintuitive, uh, and most of the talented entrepreneur I'm talking to, 
are always looking for a more senior salesperson and, and you share your opinion, which is slightly different from, from the initial uh, thoughts that we have. So this is, this is great. Um, Fred, back to you. Thank you very much, Aaron. Thank Steve. you, Julian. It was uh, great to hear you both. Uh, thank you for all the quick request questions. Um, I'm going to switch to French again. Sorry for that. Euh, voilà, c'est la fin de cette première session de la New Fan Week avec Aaron Naldoza. Euh, J'espère que du côté des participants, vous avez ben, eu ce que vous attendiez, euh, que ça correspondait en tout cas à, à, à vos attentes. Euh, on aura, aura l'occasion pour l'ensemble des entrepreneurs de New Fan de se revoir donc, dès demain matin à 8h30. Et pour le, les autres participants, n'hésitez ben, pas à nous contacter si vous avez besoin euh, de, de, de continuer la conversation, on sera là évidemment.